On the night of December 1, 2017, Maggie Long, a 17-year-old high school student, was found dead in her family's rural Bailey, Colorado home, which had been burglarized and set on fire. Investigators later determined that Maggie had been physically assaulted, then lit on fire while she was still alive. It's been just over six years since Maggie was brutally murdered, and investigators are still searching for the people responsible. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective, and each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. And if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you use. It would be greatly appreciated. All right, so this week's case, Maggie Long, it's jam-packed. We have one victim, but we have potentially three or four suspects. We have items that were allegedly stolen that, that could still be out there, maybe tracked down. Um, we have a witness that we're unaware of at this time. We know of one witness. There may be others. And at the, at the root of it all, we just have a really tragic story of a young girl who was still in high school and was taken from her family and taken from us far too early. And the, the people responsible for her horrific death, which we'll get into tonight without going into too many details, they're still out there. They're still walking amongst us. They haven't been held accountable for what they did they've done. They haven't answered for the crimes they've committed. And although this case took place six years ago, that's still relatively new when it comes to cold cases. This isn't even a cold case. This is still uh, very relevant and very solvable. So I want to get this information out there. There's a huge reward associated with it as well. Not that that should matter one way or the other, but, but it, it does play a factor for some people. Let's just call it what it is. So without wasting any more time, let's get right into it. Maggie Long, born on December 17th, 1999, was the third child of San and Heather Long, Chinese immigrants who fled to the United States from a Vietnamese refugee camp in the 1970s. The couple worked tirelessly in the restaurant industry and eventually came to own several restaurants and a liquor store in Bailey, Colorado, a small town around an hour southwest of Denver. When Maggie was a toddler, the Long family moved into their dream home located in the 3700 block of County Road 43, a very rural area around 10 minutes outside of Bailey. The home sat a quarter of a mile off the main road and was surrounded by 27 acres of secluded woodlands. Now the Long's 6,000 square foot home featured an in-law suite on the second floor, but it also had an apartment in the attic, which was rented out by a non-family member, which we'll get into more in a little bit. In 2014, Maggie started attending Platte Canyon High School and according to the Canyon Courier, Maggie's teachers and friends described her as kind, generous, ambitious, and passionate about everything. Maggie was deeply involved in her school community, participating in numerous extracurricular activities, including softball, student council, key club, national honor society, speech, debate, and theater. In late 2017, Maggie, now a senior, helped plan a concert at the high school featuring several bands from Denver. The concert was scheduled for the evening of Friday, December 1st. On that day, Maggie attended classes at Platte Canyon High School like normal. After school let out around 2.40 p.m., Maggie made the 20-minute drive home to change clothes and grab snacks for the concert, but she never returned. This worried everyone. Maggie was always responsible and wouldn't miss something important. When Maggie's friends tried calling her, all they got was her voicemail. Around the same time, the tenant who lived in the Long's family attic apartment texted Maggie's older sister, Connie, to say he was hearing quite a few loud noises coming from the downstairs area. 
Now, the tenant has never been publicly named, so I'm going to refer to him as Tim, but obviously that's not his real name. According to the flume, the noises were still occurring around 7 p.m., so Tim called 911 from his apartment. He reported that people were downstairs arguing, being violent, smashing things, and attempting to set the house on fire. Tim told the dispatcher that he was not going to leave the attic. Now, before we go any further, I want to take a quick second to hear from the first sponsor of this week's episode, Factor. Get started on your resolutions with Factor so you're ready for the new year. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success as we walk into the new year. So skip the grocery stores, the prep work, and the cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your 2024. So forget the frantic lunch preps or the rushed dinners. Factor's two-minute meals will be your secret weapon this new year. So fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals, all delivered, like I said, right to your doorstep. Factor now also offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and much more to keep me going throughout the week during my schedule. I got to tell you, right now as I'm recording this episode, for those of you who are on YouTube, I'm doing a chocolate and banana protein shake from, from Factor. It's delicious. And I'm, I've also been eating the turkey sausage and uh, cheese egg bites as well. That's something new from them, and I'm, I'm really enjoying them in the morning. I can pop them in the microwave and I'm on the go in under a couple minutes. It's great. Factor really does have everything I need, especially on a busy week. And in addition to the ready to eat meals, they also have cold pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and, and much more. Whatever you need, you go on the site, they'll probably have something that fits what you're looking for. So obviously I really enjoy Factor Meals. I think you will as well. If you want to check them out, just head over to factormeals.com slash detective 50 and use code DETECTIVE50 to get 50% off. That's code DETECTIVE50 at factormeals.com slash DETECTIVE50 to get 50% off. All right, so we're back. Now, deputies from the Park County Sheriff's Office, as well as firefighters from multiple districts, responded to the house just before 7, 12 p.m. As they headed up the quarter mile long driveway, they could see visible flames in the home's six-car garage. As firefighters went to work extinguishing the fire, deputies focused on looking up the three vehicles parked at the scene. They learned that one of the vehicles was Maggie's, another belonged to Maggie's father, son, and the third was registered to Tim, who at this point was still refusing to come out of the attic apartment. Shortly after that, Maggie's sister Connie showed up at the house and told police that Maggie was missing and that she hadn't shown up at the high school for the concert like she was supposed to. Connie also informed police that her father was out of town on a business trip in California at the time. He was currently working on acquiring an apartment complex in that state. At around 7.30, Tim called Maggie's mother, Heather, who was working at one of the family's restaurants, to tell her that he heard a loud bang and then all the lights went out in the house. The restaurant was busy, so the manager suggested Heather stay behind and that the manager would take Heather's vehicle to the house to see what was going on. The manager was not able to reach the home due to the number of law enforcement and emergency vehicles that were at the scene. The manager then called Heather and said she should come out to the house immediately. A couple who was dining at the restaurant then offered to give Heather a ride over to the house, and after Heather arrived, she and her daughter Connie weren't told what was going on by law enforcement or first responders. They had no idea where Maggie was, if she was at the house, if the people who set the house on fire had kidnapped her, or if she was somewhere else completely. San was also notified about Maggie's disappearance and the fire, and he booked the next flight home to Colorado. Firefighters continued trying to put the flames out and clear the house of all possible occupants. Just before 8 p.m., they reported to dispatch that there was a barricaded room that they were trying to get into. Now, the exact location of the room has never been publicized, but it's possible they were talking about the unit that Tim was currently staying in because minutes after they made the call to dispatch, Tim finally agreed to leave the attic apartment and spoke with detectives. And now while Tim had been located, there was still no sign of Maggie. So firefighters continued putting out the fire and searching the house. The flume reported that at 8.12 p.m., the fire had been completely extinguished. Firefighters then asked dispatch to call the Colorado Bureau of Investigations because they had discovered, quote, numerous starts to the fire 
indicating that the fire had been an arson. Now, real quick, I can't tell you exactly what the indicators would have been for this particular incident because it's an open investigation and they haven't shared that information. But I can tell you as a detective, we do take different classes regarding arson so that we can initially identify some possible indications of, of an accelerant or an area where the fire was started. In some situations as an investigator, you'll go in there and I will tell this is usually a collaborative effort with the fire department and the fire marshal, especially in Rhode Island. But we'll go in there and we'll do a preliminary search and try to see if there's anything that stands out to us. And also, in, in some cases, you can actually smell the accelerant, which in a lot of scenarios is gasoline. So as this story progresses, I'm not going to spoil it for you here. You might have an indication of what one of those indicators were as far as a possible accelerant. But yeah, they, they obviously firefighters are trained in doing this. So the minute that they're out there, they do these things all the time. They know when a fire is an electrical fire or a, a gas fire from a stove or something like that or a grease fire. And they know when something's been deliberately set based on where it started and maybe the sights and smells that they encounter as soon as they put out the fire itself. Now, although the firefighters called for the CBI, they kept searching the house for any remaining occupants. And at approximately 11 p.m., they requested the coroner come to the scene after a body was found in the bedroom. The body was assumed to be Maggie's, but they wouldn't know for sure until an autopsy was completed. The following day on December 2nd, the CBI spent hours at the long home collecting evidence. When they were done, the home was released to the family and the Park County Undersheriff released an update on Facebook saying, quote, on-scene investigation is wrapped up, cause and origin of the fire is inconclusive, still no sign of Maggie, no body at the fire scene. Obviously, this statement was a lie. A body was found at the scene and authorities were pretty sure it was Maggie's, but because of this false information, the public continued to think that Maggie was still missing. Now I have to pause here for a second and I address this elephant in the room. I can't tell you why he did this. I really can't. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. The calls were going back and forth over dispatch. And for most of you, you probably already know this, but the public can get access to a scanner on Amazon or wherever. You can get them anywhere and you can put in the frequencies for the police department, for the fire department. And a lot of people listen to the police and fire scanners just as a hobby. So the fact that they called for a coroner because they found a body, that was already public knowledge. So I really don't understand this, but I, I will say I'm going to have to foreshadow a little bit here. Someone else ends up taking over the investigation and handles it completely differently. And due to my own anecdotal experience, I've dealt with both types of leadership. So for now, I'll just say that in my opinion, the sheriff just wanted to keep everyone in the dark. He wanted to kind of, you know, hold on to hoard everything and not share any information with anyone because he wanted it to all be in house, even though it wasn't. And we'll get into more about how I feel about that type of approach in a few minutes. Now, by December 3rd, there was a lot of unanswered questions. The sheriff's office posted a statement on Facebook saying, quote, due to the serious nature of this investigation, we ask that you keep the Long family in your prayers. We are not able to release any further information at this time. That night, the sheriff's office said they were working on an active arson investigation and they did not believe that there was any risk to the public. Again, not to sidetrack this whole episode here, not really getting this. How would you know if there's a danger to the public when you don't even know how this person was killed or why they were killed? You could have a serial arsonist on the loose who's going to go on and do this to other houses in the area. You have no clue. So just to put it bluntly, I think it's very irresponsible to come out and say there's no risk to the public when regardless of what they knew behind closed doors, and I obviously they knew more than I'm relaying so far, but they don't have anybody in custody and they clearly don't know who it is and they truly don't know what the motive is. So to go out there and say this when you don't have to, I, I think was the wrong decision. Now on the following day, December 4th, a judge issued a gag order to prevent officials from discussing the investigation. That same day, the body found in the burned home was officially identified as Maggie's. Now, due to the gag order, no one was allowed to tell the public about this development. But three days later, on December 7th, the gag order was revoked. Sheriff Fred Wegener then issued a press relief notifying the public that Maggie's body had been found in the burned house and they were pursuing the investigation as a homicide. 
The sheriff announced that the task force with local, state, and federal authorities had been formed to further investigate the arson and Maggie's murder. He asked that anyone who witnessed any suspicious people, vehicles, or activities in the area of the long home to contact the investigative tip line. Sheriff Wegner also added, quote, This task will not rest until justice is obtained for Maggie and the Long family. All law enforcement resources available will be devoted to bringing this investigation to a successful outcome. Now, according to The Fume, at 4.40 p.m. that same day, the sheriff's office issued a bolo to the Denver Police Department, which stated, quote, The bolo is going to be for a late model 90s to 2000 light-colored minivan, possibly driven by a white male in his 20s. Homicide occurred during an arson, and the suspect driver may have some flash burns, as well as gasoline taken from the house, a large case, AK-47, 2,000 rounds of ammo of 762, and a 9mm Beretta. Please advise that the subject is considered armed and extremely dangerous. Now, real quickly here, I read that quote exactly the way it was put out. And the reason I did is because interchangeably, they want, at one point said suspect, and then they said subject. That just could have been a mix of words. There may be nothing to that. But I, I did found it interesting that they used two different ways to describe this person when clearly it sounds like they were someone that they were very concerned about and were pretty confident that they were involved with Maggie's murder and the arson. Now, somehow, this bolo was heard by numerous news stations in the Denver area who subsequently televised the info. And for me, it's really not that much of a mystery. As I said earlier, the public can get police scanners. It's not like this secretive thing that you can't have access to. So I know for a fact from working with the media, they have police scanners in all of their stations and, and even in their vans, and they're constantly listening to police and fire dispatch. And that's why in a lot of cases, as soon as the accident or incident occurs, in, in some situations, the media is there before law enforcement. I've definitely seen it where I show up and the police van's already getting their satellite tower up. So yeah, they're they're listening to it. They're proactively looking and 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 hoping to hear something so that while they're out there, they can be the first on scene. So this isn't that big of a, a mystery to me, but it feels like the the police department was surprised by the fact that this bolo was intercepted. And it became clear really quick that this bolo was not supposed to be released publicly. And the undersheriff told the media, quote, we did issue a bolo, but it was not intended for public consumption. It was supposed to go out through a confidential law enforcement source. I can't confirm what the news stations are reporting. It's really quite disruptive to our investigation. Because of the problems that has caused, we're going to have to reconvene the task force and decide how information for public clarification on the bolo will be crafted. Now, as far as I can tell, the police have never revealed where the information about the minivan and the suspect came from. But if I had to guess, I, I would say it came from Tim. It's possible that while he was in the attic apartment, he saw the van and the suspect outside the residence. It's, it could also be someone different. But if, if I had to take a guess, that's where, that's where I would put the odds. And as far as not wanting to put the information out there, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. This information, I guess an argument could be made by putting it out there. It could hurt the investigation. But at the same time, this is a safety hazard. This is a, this is a danger to all the residents in that community. If there's someone out there who's armed and potentially extremely dangerous, you not want only law enforcement officials looking for this individual, but you want the public not necessarily going after this person or interacting with them or confronting them, but you want them to be aware of it as well so that we don't have another victim. Now, I know they could say, well, here's the problem with that, right? If we put the bolo out there for the community, the suspect or suspects may hear it as well. Now they know we're on their trail and they may deviate from their plan. They may change up their vehicle. They may change their appearance. So we don't want to tip them off immediately that we're on to them. And I get that. I totally get it. But as a leader, there's a balance, right? There's a balance of solving the case and uh, preservation of life. And Maggie's no longer with us, but this, this person or these people, if they're capable of this, they could do it again. And they clearly have a complete disregard for human life. So I want everyone in my community to know who might be amongst them, especially if these people get desperate, if they're suspects and they know that people are looking for them. Now they may look at it like, 
that person's looking at me weird. They must know who I am. I have to, I have to hurt them or I have to kill them. And that poor, that poor individual may have no clue who they are because they weren't informed. So just by being present and not being aware of what's going on around them, they could become a victim themselves. As a leader, I'm not going to take that risk. It's a, it's a cost benefit analysis. Yeah. You have secrecy where you can get out to law enforcement agencies, maybe catch the suspects by surprise. But at the same time, you're running the risk that these potential offenders could go on to hurt multiple people in addition to the people they've already hurt. And I just, I was, I just wouldn't be willing to risk that. And obviously I'm very passionate about this. You guys know that. So I want to take a second. Let's just cool it back down. Let's get back into the story. But before we do, Let's hear from the last sponsor of this week's episode, Babbel. Okay, so what if in 2024, you got a little bit better every day? When you're learning a new language with Babbel, that's exactly what you're doing. And if Babbel can help you start speaking a new language in just three weeks, imagine what you could do in a full year. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language and, as I said, in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, and rooted in real-life situations and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. You know, I think I've mentioned it before that I learned some Spanish when I was a police officer, and I still know a little bit of it, but I'd be much better off if I continued to practice. But I also know that I want to visit some foreign countries over the next couple of years. And when I go there and I have to find out where certain locations are, or I want to order food for me or my kids, having Babbel at my disposal, knowing I can hop on the course for as little as three weeks beforehand, just to kind of catch up on that conversational speech is going to be extremely advantageous and it's going to make my vacation much more enjoyable. Plus, in addition to learning a new language, Babbel's speech recognition technology also helps you improve pronunciation and accent. And listen, Babbel's been around for a long time. They have over 10 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 language courses are backed by a 20-day money-back guarantee. So if you want to check out Babbel, here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners and viewers Right now, you can get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners and viewers at babbel.com slash detective. Once again, get 55% off at babbel.com slash detective. That's spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash detective. Rules and restrictions may apply. Okay, we're back. And by this point in the story... Rumors had been circulating about the possible motives of the homicide and the fire. One rumor was that the Long family had been having money problems and may have owed money to certain people, which resulted in the incident. Reporters from the Flume then spoke with the manager of one of the Long's restaurants and asked about the financial status of the family. The manager said the family was not having problems with money and explained that the family did not like to keep their money in the banks because they felt like they were able to get a better return by investing in real estate. Now, on December 9th, Maggie's family released a statement about her death, which read in part, quote, Our hearts are broken, and this loss has been especially significant knowing the impact our Maggie had on this small mountain community. We thank everyone in Bailey, as well as those in communities near and far that Maggie's life has touched for their support and love shared. Our family continues to work with the Park County Sheriff's Office and extended agencies. We want to thank them for their tremendous efforts. We are all committed to seeking justice for Maggie. Thank you everyone for sharing your strength and kind thoughts with us, the Long family. Over the next few months, the police continued investigating Maggie's murder. They did not give any major updates in the case during this time. On February 7, 2018, the police held their first public briefing on the case. They announced a $20,000 reward and shared quite a bit of information. They revealed that an AK-47, a 9mm Beretta, 2,000 rounds of ammunition, jade figurines and a large green safe with a combination dial and a handle were stolen from the long home on december 1st the police also released photos of what these items might have looked like now interesting enough nine news reported that sheriff wegener was asked at this briefing why his department said there was no body found in the home 
when in fact there had been a body found and he didn't have a reason, stating, we made our comment, we'll live with it. And I have to tell you, this uh, this comment, and I have to be careful, just reminds me of someone that I worked for. And I have to tell you, I wish this was like an isolated thing, but this type of personality trait in the law enforcement leadership community is, it's a coin flip. A lot of leaders go with this approach as if like they don't have to tell you anything. The only people that need to know what's going on are the people within their walls. And in some situations that is true, uh, but the the response to the media, how they how they address it, you know, these one sentence answers. I personally don't like it. May some maybe some of you say, hey, I get it, I understand it. I've seen it from the inside and I I personally was never a fan of it. Now, Wegener was also asked why he waited more than two months to go public with the information detailing what was stolen from the home. He said, quote, a lot of it had to do with the amount of information that we were processing. He mentioned that investigators had conducted a lot of interviews and had obtained DNA samples from a number of people, but he didn't disclose whether or not that information had been helpful. Wegener went on to state that based on the information they had gathered, they were confident that there was no threat to anybody else. And while no arrest had been made, the police had made progress. And I just, I'll just say it again. I don't want to sound redundant here. I don't know how you compute that. I don't know how you say definitively there's no threat to the public when you don't have anybody in custody. And even if you didn't have someone in custody, if you knew for certain why the longs were targeted and what the motive was behind it and you could isolate it to them, then yeah, maybe you can say that. But based on what we know publicly, I don't know how you would come to that conclusion and be 100% certain of it. I just don't see it. But again, I always have to preface it by saying I don't have access to the case files. Maybe there's something he knows that we don't. So a few months later, on May 4th, officials released a sketch of a white male who was seen at Maggie's house on the day she was killed. Now, as far as I can tell, they didn't include a description of the man and no other major information regarding Maggie's murder was released for the rest of the year. In January of 2019, a New Park County Sheriff named Tom McGraw took office. At the end of the month, McGraw held a press conference where he revealed a lot of important details about Maggie's case, including the fact that she was, quote, purposely set on fire and burned alive by three male suspects. McGraw said investigators believe Maggie came home from school at around 3 p.m., and walked in on a robbery. A physical altercation broke out, and Maggie was then held captive until she and the house were set on fire hours later at approximately 7 p.m. Investigators theorized that the fires were started to conceal the physical altercation and the robbery. Sheriff McGraw then shared a sketch of one of the two new suspects and mentioned that a sketch of the third suspect would be released in the following months. McGraw further revealed that three vehicles were seen at or near the long home at the time of the incident. The vehicles were described as a white Chevy Astro type work van, an early 90s Ford Aerostar van, and a late 80s Ford F-150. Sheriff McGraw announced a new reward of $50,000 and the launch of a website run by the Maggie Long Task Force had been initiated. He stated, quote, We asked the public to carefully review the updated information and consider whether someone they know could have been involved in this incident or whether someone they know has demonstrated behavior that could be suggestive of involvement in this incident. McGraw cautioned the public that, quote, one or more of these suspects might have been injured in the fire and it was possible all three could have significantly altered their appearances, sold their vehicles, and possibly moved since December of 2017. A few months later, a sketch of the third suspect wanted in connection to Maggie's murder was released as promised. Before the end of the year, the FBI announced that a fourth person may have been involved in Maggie's murder as well. They said, quote, it could be a male or a female, but we believe there's possibly a fourth person that is either involved in the burglary on December 1st, 2017, or that might be a key witness that we would like to talk to. Now, there isn't much info out there about this potential fourth suspect, and from what I can tell, no sketch was ever released. More than a year later, in May of 2021, The FBI announced that the investigation into Maggie's death was being reclassified as a, quote, hate crime matter, and the reward was being upped to $75,000. Now, interesting enough, Maggie's older sisters, Lena and Connie, 
told the Associated Press that they did not notice any overt Asian discrimination when they lived in the Bailey community. With that being said, the sisters were hopeful that this reclassification would bring new light to a cold case. Lena stated, quote, This is an angle that wasn't looked into in the past, and at this point, there's no stone left unturned. Looking at the extent of the violence in this crime, that is certainly an angle to look more closely into. Connie further shared with the New York Times that the FBI investigator explained to her that the choice to reclassify Maggie's homicide as a hate crime was not influenced by any particular development in the ongoing investigation. It was a strategic decision that would provide additional funds and resources for law enforcement to enhance their efforts in solving the case. And I just want to piggyback off of that because when I was initially hearing it and reading about this before I got to the segment, that part right there, I didn't know they would disclose that publicly. When I first heard that it was reclassified as a hate crime, I said to myself, oh, they're looking for more funds, you know, and obviously with a hate crime, the government funding that comes in for it. And obviously it's a, it's a term, it's obviously it's, it's horrible, but it's a term and, and a, and a type of crime that it, there's a high level of priority put on it by the government right now. So whenever a, a crime gets reclassified or is initially classified as a hate crime, there's a different level of severity that's put on it, which will allow investigators to pull more funding to get the resources they need to potentially solve the case. So I've seen this done before and it's, it's in some cases a good move. The only argument that I've seen against it is by reclassifying cases that you don't believe are hate crimes, you could potentially be taking away from re real hate crimes. And I absolutely see that angle and I, I really don't have an argument for it. It's that, that the potential is there when you're employ, you know, employing these types of tactics. Now, with all that being said, unfortunately, as far as the family can tell, the reclassification did not lead to any major developments in Maggie's case. And by December of 2022, five years had passed since Maggie was murdered. To mark the somber occasion, police handed out flyers and stickers across the county. Postcards with information about Maggie were also mailed to the Bailey residents. A detective on the task force also spoke with Nine News about where the case was currently. They said the force was still actively investigating Maggie's murder. However, they were, quote, kind of backing off the sketches that were released initially. They were no longer putting much credence into them. And as far as why that's the case, again, without having access to the files, I really can't tell you. I will say, and we've had the sketches up in this episode, they're pretty vague. They're not very descriptive. There's no distinguishable marks on either of the the individuals that have been released or the three individuals that have been released that I think someone would look at and go, oh, that looks like so-and-so. I guess if you knew them personally and really well, maybe, but um, there must have been contradicting information that came in that discredited the initial report. Or as I said earlier, it, it depends on the source, right? It depends on the person you're getting the information from. I don't know what the situation was with Tim, but some of the other things reading about him, I don't know uh, what his mindset was. I know that, again, he was refusing to leave the apartment until firefighters basically kicked him out and he came walking out with his cat. But if that was their source and he was going back and forth on what he observed or what he heard, the more he does that, the less credible those statements become. Now, for the five-year mark, the Long family released a statement which read in part, quote, Maggie deserves justice. She was an irreplaceable, innocent soul with a majestic presence. She brought joy to our family, her friends, and her community that will never be forgotten. By this point, Maggie's parents, Heather and San, had sold their family home. After Maggie was murdered inside, the memories in the house made it too difficult for them to go back. They also couldn't return to their businesses, so they retired and later moved to the suburbs of Denver. In their new home, the Long set up a special room for Maggie using the items saved from the fire. Connie told CPR News that there has been a huge change in her parents and she didn't think they would ever recover from Maggie's death. In December of 2023, six years had passed since Maggie was murdered. Park County Sheriff Tom McGraw stated, quote, Our quest for justice for Maggie remains steadfast. The dedicated members of the Maggie Long Task Force have never stopped the search for those responsible for Maggie's death and will continue to follow every lead until we find resolution in this case. Unfortunately, 
This is the latest information we have in this investigation. Now, the task force is still actively searching for the three or four people who physically assaulted Maggie and then set her on fire while she was still alive. Now, with that being said, Maggie's family is in desperate need of answers, and they are determined to keep searching until they find them. Okay, so now my perspective on this case, and this could be a long one because I have a lot of bullet points. I don't really have a synopsis. I just want to kind of jump around. So hopefully it all makes sense as I put it out there. Just my thoughts on this case with the limited information that we do know, because although we have some specifics, I can promise you there's still a lot behind closed doors that we don't know. But with that being, you know, the qualifier, first, I want to start with someone we mentioned early in the episode, but haven't mentioned much since, which is Tim. And I'm sure a lot of you are asking yourself, was Tim vetted? You know, do we know that Tim isn't a suspect, that Tim wasn't the one who did this? Could Tim had gone downstairs, attacked Maggie, killed her, and then set the house on fire to kind of throw people off the trail, go back up into his apartment and then call the police and say that all these things were happening and there was a fire being set because I had wrote a note. He knew a lot of information about what was going on in the in the downstairs floor. I don't know how thin the walls were or what he could hear, but it just seemed like he had a lot of information. And my I, my initial thought is, hey, you got to look at the guy who was actually in the house when all this went down as a potential suspect, right? And I'm sure a lot of you did the same thing. So I want to put that out there because after putting that out there, then I'm going to kind of discredit my own my own thought process. And, and the reason I'm able to do that is because it's it seems like it's pretty concrete information that the AK-47, the 9mm Beretta, 2,000 rounds in ammo, which by the way is a lot and it would be heavy, um, the figurines, and then also most importantly, this large green safe. They probably confirmed through family members that this was there when they left earlier that day and now it's gone and that's how they were able to deduce what was taken. And This tells you two things. Obviously, it does suggest that more than likely it was a robbery and not a staged robbery. And I say that from a commonsensical perspective of if you're trying to stage a robbery, you can take some smaller things and get out of there. You're not going to take the freaking most heaviest thing in the house. That would make no sense at all. The only reason you would take a safe is because you felt something of value was inside of it, which brings me to another point, because on one hand, you could say, well, it couldn't have been Tim because he was there the whole time. So how could he have removed the stuff and still gotten back to the house in time to do all this unless it was like premeditated and it was happening all day. But I think that's a stretch, but, but it brings up another angle here that I don't know if anybody's really thought about. I'm hoping that law enforcement did. If this was a robbery, okay, let's go back to the long family home. 27 acres. I think I said earlier, 27 acres. This was a huge property off a main road, but really set back, really off the beaten path. Who would know about what's back there? More importantly, who would know about what's inside that residence, specifically what a value is inside that residence? In many situations, when you we have a robbery and the person has a safe or a lot of money or guns or something of value in their home, it's usually an inside job, right? Or, or, or that person had bragged about what they had to people in the community and it got back to them. You know, they, they, they started to, you know, figure out when they could go there because think about all the elements of what we're dealing with here. The father was out of town. The mother was at work. The sisters weren't home. And it was kind of probably not expected for Maggie to come home. She came home just to change. So I think it's very plausible that the theory the police are running with is right. She walked in on a robbery. The question I have is how do they know what was inside of there? Did Maggie know her attackers? Were these people who had worked on the house prior, were they construction workers who had been in the house to do something else or around the property and had noticed that they had expensive items inside the residence? I would want to look into any work that had been done on that property. It's a big property. So I'm assuming they had landscapers and maintenance men, et cetera. So obviously you'd want to investigate all of them and their, and their acquaintances, but just to play another angle here, again, not knowing Tim personally or not being able to interview him. 
is there a scenario where he tipped someone off about what was in the house, about what he had seen, and maybe said to someone he knows, whether it was maliciously or just speaking, running his mouth, right? He might have said that there's a lot in the house and they got a lot of money and they keep a lot of their money in the safe. We talked about that earlier. They didn't believe in banks. So if that information was out there and Tim or someone close to them knew about it, they could have tipped these assailants off that now was the time to come. And it brings me back to my point, who would know better that it was the right time to come than a person who was staying at the home? Now, I want to qualify this by saying I don't have any concrete evidence against him. Obviously, as I said at the top of the show, that's not even his real name, but it's a possible scenario, and I'm sure it's been explored. But I could also make another argument where when detectives started to search and talk to people in the community about their financial, potential financial problems with the Longs, as I said in this episode, which is why I wanted it in there, one of the managers who, again, is someone who's close to them, they're obviously an administrative role, but they were even aware that the Longs were someone who didn't keep money in the banks. They wanted to invest it in real estate. And more than likely, that meant that they had more cash on hand at the home. In a community like that, word can travel fast. And again, it may not be someone you're directly connected to, but if it gets back to a group of individuals with nothing to lose, they could come up with a plan to attack you and your family uh, when you're home or even when, or, or when you're not home. And just to kind of explore the whole construction worker, maintenance man, landscaper theory a little bit more, think about the potential suspect vehicles that we're talking about here. Two vans and a pickup truck. Could these individuals work in that type of field and that's why they drive those cars? That's possible. I'll also say that I I don't know how these cars would be linked to these crimes if they didn't have something definitive at the property that would prove these vehicles were there, right? They're they're pretty sure about the fact that it was three individuals. That's how they're coming up with the number of three suspects, right? Only one person can drive each vehicle, so at minimum there's three. Now they're saying there was potentially four, which would mean there was a passenger in one of the vehicles. I would assume most of this information would be coming from Tim. I don't know how it would come from anybody else, unless they have a confidential witness or a confidential informant that they're keeping under wraps for right now who is close by, maybe on the property working and just doesn't want to have their information out there. That is very possible. And finally, as far as the sketches, I kind of said it in the episode, they were pretty vague. I think that talking to this witness, there might've been something there that caused pause where they started to question what this individual had said. I've said it in other episodes where you'll have witnesses who want to be helpful And instead of telling you what they know, they tell you what they think or what they kind of remember. That's not good for the case. Yeah, their heart is in the right place, but it only hurts us because if we're building an investigation off something that the source is not even sure is accurate, that's a problem. I would rather have minimal factual information than than an abundance of potentially accurate information. If you know what I mean, I'd rather know for sure What I'm dealing with, what puzzle pieces I have on the table are at least from the same, the same puzzle, right? You don't want to have a mixture because there's only, there's really no way to know until you start building it. You could go all the way down that path and find out well down the road that you're working with three different cases here and some of it's not even accurate. And that's, that's a big problem. So again, them going back and re-questioning other individuals uh, along with this, this main witness there may be some indications that the the illustrations that were created based off the descriptions um, that were given at the time, the descriptions themselves may not be accurate, which could be actually narrowing their suspect pool, right? They're looking for white males. They could be a different ethnicity. They could look different than the picture itself. So now they're looking for certain individuals with those types of vehicles, and they could be looking in the wrong direction. So as far as where we go with this case, as I've said throughout the episode, you have Local, state, and federal agents already working on it. So it's all hands on deck. There's a lot of money and resources being devoted to this case. So I'd like to think that most of what I'm going to say is being currently worked on or has been looked into. Obviously, they're going to keep an eye on the stolen items. More than likely, those items will never end up in a pawn shop. But maybe if you're lucky, if a criminal gets stupid, a witness who has no involvement walks into a house, remembers these things being put out there, and sees one of these items in the home 
and decides to do the right thing and report it. I'm also hopeful that even though it was a fire and it probably destroyed a lot of the evidence, there may have been some DNA evidence recovered from the scene because most likely that's why they're seizing DNA from the people they're speaking to because they have something to compare it to. It, at least that's my hope. Uh, and then finally, they're going to be looking at help from you guys. They're going to be looking at help from people in that community who may know something. And I would say to everyone out there who may be from that area, even though the sketches, they're backing off of them, let's put those to the side for the second. Let's think about these vehicles because they sound more convinced about the three vehicles. Think about people in your life, acquaintances of yours. And, you know, sometimes you'll have groups of ind individuals who hang out together, whether they're colleagues or just buddies that hang out at the Bowen Alley, who knows. But maybe you think about someone like, oh, you know, this guy had an F-150 and his friend so-and-so drove a van and actually his other friend drove an Astro van. It could be that connection. You may not, the sketches may look nothing like these guys, but if you know a group of individuals that hang out that at the time of this incident, because I can promise you they don't have these cars anymore, um, were driving vehicles like that, call local authorities, call the state police, let them know what's going on and give them the information and, and then let them decide whether it's useful or not. And so just to bring this full circle to ensure that you have all the information, we're going to recap the case really quickly. On December 1st, 2017, 17-year-old Maggie Long was found murdered in her burned home located in the 3700 block of County Road 43 in Bailey, Colorado. She had been physically assaulted and then set on fire while she was still alive. An AK-47, a 9mm Beretta, 2,000 rounds of ammunition, jade figurines, and a large green safe with a combination dial and a handle were stolen from the long home. There are three to four unidentified suspects in this case, and they were potentially driving a white Chevy Astro-type work van, an early 90s Ford Aerostar van, and a late 80s Ford F-150. So if you have any information about this case, you're asked to call the Maggie Long Task Force tip line at 303-239-4243. And just remember, a $75,000 reward is still available. And that's going to do it for this week's case. I want to send my thoughts out to the Long family. This is obviously a horrific murder. All murders obviously are horrific. But just to think about how Maggie was taken from us, the manner in which it was done, um, her family has to live with that. And there's nothing that you or I can do to change that. But what we can do is try to give them the answers they deserve. They're still fighting. As I said at the end of this episode, we're going to continue fighting. And hopefully someone out there, whether you're watching or listening, has information that can be critical in helping crack this case. I want everyone to stay safe out there. But before I go, I just want to remind you, because we're getting close here to the end, uh, Seasons of Justice, okay? I had asked initially for $1,000. We've already surpassed that. We're up to like $1,055. I think I have one more episode after this for the month of January, and then it's over. I think it's set to 1500 right now. I'd love to hit it. You know, I'd love to hit the 1500 If we don't, that's okay. But if you haven't donated yet and you have a dollar or $2 or $5 that you'd like to donate, it'd be greatly appreciated. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you let me know if you donated. I've already responded to a couple of you. I really do appreciate it. And I'm just going to give you the information for the website. Again, it's going to be up on the screen right here. But for those audio listeners, it might make it a little, a little easier for you guys. I'm also going to give you the, the phone number because you can actually just text message as well. And that phone number is 53 five 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 and all you have to do is text detective to that number so if you want to donate just text detective to that five three five 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 or you can go on the website which is on the screen right now or if you're listening on audio it'll be in the description box below that's all i got guys everyone stay safe out there i'll see you next week